Hello, I'm Dr. Sam Hancock of the Emerald Planet and Emerald Planet TV. We come to you on a week-to-week -week basis from Washington, D.C. in the United States as we look around the globe in 144 different nations looking for those thousand best practices, the technology, services, and products that are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And as we have a planet of 9 billion people by 2038 and possibly 12 to 13 billion by the end of this century, how are we going to be able to take care of all these people on planet Earth? And that's what Emerald Planet's all about. We come to you looking at the solutions, the best practices from around the globe as we create the Emerald Planet. Hello, welcome to the Emerald Planet. We're making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And seeing the long-term impacts of climate change, for being with us. Looking at nature around us, we have many creatures that we see, sometimes just ignore, but yet are critical to life here on planet Earth. Uh, the bees, the birds, the bats, everything has its place. And at the same time, the food production is actually aided and abetted by all these creatures that we have around us. Now we're going to be talking about pollination and pollinators and why they're so critically important and what we as humans need to do to protect them. We have an expert that's going to be talking about this. This is Carrie L. Wexted. She is the education outreach specialist for what's called the Wildlife and Heritage Service at the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. And we're going to be talking about what's pollination and why should we care. Carrie, welcome to the Emerald Planet TV. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here. Tell us a, a little bit about the mission and the vision of the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. So the Department of Natural Resources leads Maryland in securing a sustainable future for our environment, society, and economy by preserving, protecting, restoring, and enhancing the state's natural resources. Within the department, the Wildlife and Heritage Service, which I work for, um, is tasked with conserving Maryland's diverse wildlife plants and the natural communities that support them using scientific expertise and informed public um, input. Well, it's really critical and also it's quite beautiful, the work that you're actually doing. So tell us a little bit about what is pollination and the obvious question is, why should we care about it? So pollination, um, the ultimate goal of most living organisms is to create the next generation of offspring. In plants, reproduction often occurs via pollination. So pollination is the transfer of pollen from the male parts of the flower to the female parts of the flower. Now looking at the monarch butterfly, that really is the poster child as far as pollination is concerned, but also the beauty of nature. Why are monarchs but they're just a, a cast or one uh, part of thousands of different pollinators. Why is that really such an example of pollination that most uh, people resonate with? I think a lot of it is due in part to their beauty. They're very gorgeous butterflies. In addition, they have a lot of cultural significance too. Uh, they have multi-generational migration and it expands all the way from Canada down to Mexico each year. So it captivates a very, very large audience. Now looking at the, the flowers, the plants, and then the pollinators themselves, tell us about this process. It's very <laughs> complex. Uh, it's evolved over millions of years, and yet it's critically important not only to uh, the individual plants and their species, but also to human life as well. Yes. So pollination, again, is that transfer of pollen from the male, um, male parts to the female parts of the flower. And in this diagram, you can see the stamens, which are the male parts, and at the tips, there are these things called anthers. In the center of the diagram, you'll see the pistil, which is the female part. And at the tip of the pistil, there's a spot called the stigma, which accepts the pollen. Essentially, once pollen hits that stigma, if it's from the same species, it's going to travel down that tube called the style into the ovary, which is at the base of the pistil. And then it's going to interact with the unfertilized eggs or ovules there in the ovary. 
successful fertilization is going to result in the development of seeds and fruits. Now that's absolutely incredible. But looking at this is the talking about the different ways that pollination occurs, and then we'll get into the pollinators themselves. What what are the different ways that we're looking at actually in this photograph? So pollination can occur in many ways. Um, some plants like corn use wind to assist with moving pollen from plant to plant. And then other uh, plants use water as a pollen vector. And then we have plants um, like the orchid in the middle there that can actually self-pollinate by this species in particular has the, the pollen kind of dangling over the stigma and it just drops down and fertilizes itself. However, many of the world's plants uh, use some type of animal to move that pollen from one plant to another. And the first records of animal assisted pollination are from around 100 million years ago. Beetles were among the first pollinators as well as wasps. Yeah, that's absolutely amazing. Looking at this photograph, uh, this really summarizes what's going on in this pollination process. Tell us what we're actually seeing here. Essentially, by having an animal move that pollen for you, um, you're moving it greater distances than what you could usually do just as a plant. If you think about it, plants are kind of rooted there and, and really can't move along. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, uh, so that animal, animal mediated pollination helps that pollen to travel further distances and also helps with that genetic diversity. That's absolutely fantastic. Now we're looking uh, at a bee and we're calling it an animal. So some people may be confused. We think of uh, deer and squirrels and rabbits and you know, hundreds of other varieties, uh, but you're calling this bee and uh, the pollinators that we're talking about as animals. Why are we calling it an animal? Well, the majority of animal species worldwide lack backbones like this bee. So over 90% of our, our described species are what we call invertebrates. So it's not just the big uh, furry and, and feathery animals that are part of the animal kingdom. Uh, very, very important. Now looking at this, this is, again is a good way to exhibit what's going on and how pollination occurs. Tell us what we're seeing here. So this is a picture of two ruby-throated hummingbirds, and essentially it's showing you kind of the co-evolution of the design of the flowers and the pollinators, because these relationships have evolved over mi millions of years. Those tubular flowers are designed for something with a long tongue to get down in there and get to the nectar, but you can see on the left-hand side of the photo that stamen right above the female's head, that's designed to deposit that pollen on her head. So making sure that that plant gets fertilized in the process. So looking at the, the plants and animals, that really it's coexisting, and but it's evolving over time. We have a tendency as humans to think everything is static. Uh, and then all of a sudden science comes in and we're uh, changing everything. But what I think what you're saying is, is that these plants and animals are evolving over a period of time and actually changing themselves. Yes. Yeah, when you, um, self-fertilization will work, but you don't get that exchange of genetic material from another individual. And variety is the spice of life that allows us to evolve and um, deal with different changes in our environments. So it's really important that we have that. Looking at this chart, this is really quite complex. Uh, yet yeah, gives us an overview of uh, all the different ways that plants, uh, animals interact, and also as far as the pollination, the fertilization. What are we actually seeing here? Well, oftentimes you can look at a flower and figure out some clues on their pollination strategy. And pollination syndromes, which is shown on this chart, are suites of flower traits that have evolved in response to natural selection imposed by different pollen vectors. So for example, plants are going to put energy into showy flowers that smell good to attract animals. They don't need to bother with that if they're just putting all their pollen out into the wind. So they're not going to have colorful petals or special scents. And also uh, looking at, you know, we see the bees, the birds, uh, the butterflies, you know, that gives everybody a warm, uh, cozy feeling. Uh, but you see bats and beetles and flies in this mix as well. So. Uh, how do we need to protect all living creatures so that uh, the nature of life continues to evolve? 
Essentially, they're all part of a web, and they provide pollination services that benefit not only us, but also other organisms. Bats, for example, pollinate a lot of different fruit crops, and they also help pollinate things like agave, which brings us tequila. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a good thing. Uh, but flies, <laughs> that's kind of an ooh uh, factor there, but uh, they're critical as far as pollination, correct? Yes, yeah, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay. Uh, looking at the diversity that we're seeing here, tell us what we're actually seeing and why this mix of images for us to understand this process as far as what pollination is all about. So this is just showing you some examples of those pollination syndromes. Flowers that are purple and stinky, like the pawpaw in the left picture, are pollinated by flies. So their strategy is to resemble rotting flesh to attract their pollinators. And I find it really amusing that a gorgeous flower like that pawpaw can smell so bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and pawpaws produce edible fruits that have a banana custard-like taste, and they were actually George Washington's favorite fruit. Mm. That's a good historical antidote. Looking at the, the bee and then the, the other flower. So the golden rods there in the center, they have those showy yellow flowers and those are designed to attract bees. And the red tubular flowers like the cardinal flower are attractive in our area to hummingbirds. So again, it has that design very similar to the plant that I showed earlier, where it has those red tubes that essentially um, need somebody with a long tongue to get down in there. That's fantastic. Now, looking at the fruits and vegetables in front of us, uh, we don't really think about this. We just think we go to the grocery store and we buy what we need or go to the farmer's markets. Uh, but there's a lot of other beings out there, plants and animals, uh, that are critical to us having this food. Is that what we're seeing here? Yes. In the United States, almost one third of all of our agricultural output depends on pollinators. So. If you like to eat, you should thank a pollinator. <laughs> and about 90% of our nation's apple crop is pollinated by bees, just to give you an example. So looking at the fruits and vegetables in front of us, Carrie, uh, there's a great uh, number and diversity of pollinators then that are actually bringing us these fruit and vegetables on a day-to-day -day basis in reality, correct? Yes, yeah, it's, uh, and some of it depends on the different flower structures produced by those plants and also where they evolved. So North American fruits and vegetables like squashes are going to uh, have better pollination strategies with the pollinators that were here in North America that evolved with them. Uh, good, uh, uh, the specialization. Chocolate, most people love chocolate, uh, but tell us a little bit about that because you were sharing that earlier as far as what is the real pollinator for chocolate? Yeah, so this is this is why we need flies. Um, because if you like chocolate like me, you have to thank the flies. There's a special type of midge that can only pollinate these um, chocolate flowers. They have these tiny little hoods that hide the, the stamens. And so that little midge kind of pushes its way into those, um, those flowers and pollinates it. Now, certainly other things can help pollinate it, but those flies are the best at it and they're going to give us the best chance of success of having a chocolate crop. Oh, that sounds absolutely great. I'm going to move through this and I'm going to end up here. Why do we need to protect the, the animals and broad category of animals to pollinate our food? And we have about 20 seconds to do that, Carrie. Well, pollinators are more than important just for us. They're important for healthy ecosystems. They assist with plant reproduction and feed other animals, like the warbler pictured there. Dr. Doug Tallamy at the University of Del Delaware has quantified the importance of insects for our songbirds. And um, over 90% of them need to feed their, in uh, their young insects. So it's keeping that food web together. Fantastic. Uh, this is Carrie L. Wexted, Education Outreach Specialist, Wildlife and Heritage Services at the Veteran Department of Natural Resources as we create the Emerald Planet.